Okay, thank you all for your patience. Let's begin. I'm Eamon Kyo, and my colleague um, Nguyen will talk to you this afternoon. Just a, briefly in advance, my colleague Nguyen was denied a flight in America, and instead of going home, he spent the last 18 hours driving here. He got here a few hours ago. He'll be here, he'll be very tired, but we appreciate his uh, great efforts. And any talk and tutorial at KDD, there's always a danger of overselling things. Having said that, these are the best ideas in time that mine them in the last two decades. And I'm gonna convince you of that hopefully in the next hour. Uh, it's a grand claim, but I hope you'll believe that when we're done. So, a bit of the usual uh, disclaimers and boilerplate. This is actually work based upon a lot of very smart people, some of which are here today. Uh, so actually, the main architects are Michael, and, sorry, uh, Anne and Jan. And you'll probably recognize them, you'll see them around today, say hi to them. Actually, Anne's lost a bit of weight since then, but otherwise she looks the same. And I also want to thank our sponsors. People have given us lots of money to do this kind of research, we really appreciate it. But of course, all the crazy claims are mine and wins alone, not the agencies. So time series, fortunately, is an inherently visual domain. So I have almost no equations and proofs in mathematics. You don't need them in some sense. If you do want them, you can go to the papers, you can go to the code and so forth. So hopefully you'll forgive me and appreciate that. It's mostly pictures today. All data sets and experiments in this tutorial are freely available. You can grab the code for free, grab the data sets for free, reproduce it, change it, modify it, make sure we're all telling you the truth. And finally, if you like this tutorial, we have lots of other great tutorials you should actually check out offline. So here's the outline for today. In the first act, that's me, I'm gonna talk about our fundamental assumption, which is actually very limited and very reasonable, and then the meat of this. What is the matrix profile? I'll describe properties of it, and we'll develop a visual intuition for it. It's a data structure that actually you can look at, and has nice visual interpretations and intuitiveness, and in fact, that may be all you need for many problems. You might be done at that point. But then we'll show you actually that we can use this matrix profile to build lots of really clever algorithms chain discovery, causality discovery, motifs, anomaly detection, so on and so forth. Then I'm gonna show you a very clever trick, which actually is a paper in this conference, so you can see it in detail in the next few days, which is, although this is all domain agnostic, if you have a very specialized domain, there's a nice easy trick you can do to write three or four lines of code and push that on top of what we've done here today to adapt it for your particular domain. And then finally, I'm gonna show you a very strange and interesting philosophy which says that for almost all people in time that are mining, the matrix profile plus 10 lines of code is all you need, right? In other words, whatever you wanna do, you have the matrix profile, you write three or four lines of Excel or MATLAB or Python, and you're done. And doing that, you can actually reproduce the effort in hundreds of papers that we published in the past, and hopefully going forward, you can do hundreds of other cool things. So that's the first half. In the second half, we will actually say how you compute this matrix profile in the first place. But I'm going to actually completely ignore that in, the, in this first half. Lovely. So let's begin. So here's our simple fundamental assumption, which is conservation is key. And this actually makes sense because it's true in DNA and dance and writing and linguistics and everywhere else. So one example is the word for the male parent, your father, in hundreds of languages, which are very diverse, is dada or papa or tata. And once you see that, you have to think there's some mechanism that creates that. It might be in culture, it might be in neuroscience, it might be in the physiology of a mouth, but there's surely something that makes that conservation be true. Likewise, if you have people who are anemic and you look at the DNA, and there's a strongly conserved piece of DNA for those people, it strongly suggests that that piece of DNA is part of this um, medical disease. So conservation is key. Now in the discrete world, uh, ASCII text or DNA, we can actually talk about equality of conservation, but of course for time series, things aren't exactly conserved, they're approximately conserved. So here's actually a piece of uh, time series, and it looks almost random maybe, potentially, but it turns out actually if you search through this very carefully, as we'll see today, you can find repeated or semi-repeated patterns so here's one, two, which are motif one here. And it's hard to see, but there are other motifs here and here. 
And of course, once you find these repeated patterns, you can now ask about, well, is there a grammar? Is there a vocabulary? Do they change with time or season or temperature or something else? And so it turns out that most of the times it's data mining. It's basically reason about when things are conserved, why they're conserved, when they're not conserved, and so on and so forth. So our fundamental assumption is we're not interested in the overall properties of time series. We're interested in these local repeated patterns in most cases. Great. So what is this magical thing that makes this profile? It's simply a data structure that annotates a time series. And here's our key claim here, which is, if you're given a matrix profile, most problems in time series are either solved already or trivially solvable in a line of code or two. A very strong but true claim. And those problems include classification, clustering, rule discovery, density detection, anomaly detection, and so on and so forth. Once you have the MP, then getting all these things is basically very easy or essentially trivial. And another key insight is that the Bayes profile has many desirable properties, almost in some sense magical properties. And if you use the Bayes profile, you inherit all those properties for free with no extra work. Let me give you an example. A colleague of mine who works at sleep psychology has written an algorithm to segment sleep states with the Bayes profile. And once she has done that, then for free, she already gets an anytime algorithm to do this, an unknown algorithm to do this, parallelized algorithm, an algorithm that can do that with missing values and so forth. You shouldn't have to do anything extra. This all came for free once you committed to use the matrix profile. So these freebies are actually very, very cool. Let me show you the properties you actually you get essentially using the MP. And these make more sense as you go along today, but very for now. First of all, it's exact. Most algorithms to, get, to be, have scalability in this time series world tend to be approximations using hashes and so forth. But we can skew that, we can give you the exact answer. We have a very simple parameter free approach. Again, many algorithms using hashing or, or trees will have to use a lot of index structures and whatnot. Very, very complicated, have to be tuned. Forget all that. This is simple parameter free. We're very space efficient. Many algorithms in this space. The data structure that actually encodes the time series is much bigger than the time series itself. For example, a suffix tree typically is 10 times bigger than the data it represents. And that means you might actually have to take a small piece of data, explode it so large that partially it's on disk, and have a very, very nasty problem. So the overhead of this profile is actually almost inconsequential. All the algorithms we base on the matrix profile allow anti algorithms. What that means simply is that on a big data set, if it takes an hour to actually finish, in the first few seconds, you'll have an approximate answer. You can look at it and say, that makes sense, keep on going. Or that makes sense, stop what already done. Or that makes no sense, let me stop it now and change something and do it again. And again, this all comes for free. You don't do anything, this is just built in. The Bitcoin profile is incrementally maintainable. What that means is essentially is that you can build it on last year's data and now as new data comes in every, every second, every minute, you can just update things in constant time. And that's a very important property because you can actually, of course, uh, keep your data fresh forever. The Ventus profile is trivially easy to leverage hardware. It's actually only important for maybe 10% of the people in the world. For the average entomologist, doctor, whatever it might be, it's already fast enough on your laptop, you're done. But if you're Google or Amazon or somebody Oracle, you're going to, need to have a very fast version of this. Um, you can actually parallelize it. You can put it on GPUs, FPGAs in a very trivial way. This property we return to because it's very unintuitive. The Bayes profile is 100% free of the cursed dimensionality. So if you worked with most types of data, especially time series, you'll know dimensionality is critical. Your algorithm might be reasonably fast for 100 data points. And for 200 data points, it slows down quite a bit. For 400, it slows down quite a bit. And then for 800, it's basically worse than brute force search. In contrast, we don't care what dimensionality is. We've done dimensionalities up to a million, and we get the same speed as for 100. Another interesting property is we can make these things in deterministic time. So almost all algorithms in the space, in the best case, can be fast, and the worst case can be slow, very slow, and you can't tell ahead of time what you're going to get. So you run it, it might take a second, it might take an hour, and you'll never know ahead of time. In contrast, given only the size of the data, we can actually tell you ahead of time this will take 17 seconds to compute, and we'll be right within 1%. It's 
is very, very useful for planning resources and everything else you can imagine. We can handle missing data, which is actually a very common thing to have in time series, and get exact answers. And then finally, this is subjective, the metrics profile really allows very simple, elegant solutions with the metrics profile, three or four lines of code, and you're done. Okay, all sounds good, and it all makes sense as we go throughout this talk. So we're gonna begin by developing a visual intuition of the metrics profile, and I'm gonna tell you what it looks like and what it does without saying how to compute it. My colleague in the afternoon will tell you actually how to compute it, but for most of you, actually, you almost don't care. You just download the code and run it. But if you're a Google or Oracle, you do care, my colleague will help you in the afternoon. You might think, actually, when you look at this, that it's too slow to be computed. That's probably your, your first intuition. But again, my colleague will show you actually that isn't the case. And then finally, we're gonna actually look at this profile to understand what's going on. But most algorithms that actually use matrix profile don't require you to visualize it. That's just the kind of a bonus you can do, uh, but isn't actually necessary. Let's get to it. So here we have a fake time series, but it could be heartbeats or uh, stock market or medical, whatever it could be. And the time series here is of length n, in this case 3,000 data points. For most people, most of the time, they don't care about the global properties of the time series. The global average, the global maximum, they're usually pretty much irrelevant. People care about is local subsequences. Those are actually interesting. So if we have a year of data, we really care about the day-to-day -day potentially. Or if we have an hour of heartbeats, we care about the one-second heartbeats, not the global properties in most cases. And so these small subsequences I mentioned, we represent by M here, length 100. And this is the appropriate length in this domain for looking at these patterns, we'll say. Okay, we're now to see our first matrix profile. The matrix profile is this blue data structure here. It's a pseudo time series, if you like. It's almost exactly as long as the original data. It's shorter by actually the subsequence length that's missing at the end here. And what is this blue time series? All it is is a data structure that tells you how far subsequences are to the nearest neighbor in Euclidean distance space. Let me be concrete here. Let me pick a random location, 921 here, and here's a subsequence here begin at 921 of length m, or 100. And my claim actually is that that subsequence has a nearest neighbor in Euclidean space. It could be there, it could be there, it could be there. I don't know, I don't care at this point. But it's this that nearest neighbor is 177 in Euclidean distance. Which as it happens is not particularly close, as you might imagine, it's a very noisy subsequence. Let's contrast that to make that a bit clearer. Let's pick a different location. And this location, of course, has a very low matrix profile value. And it tells me that the subsequence that begins here at 378 must be very close to its nearest neighbor, which is probably, you can guess, either that guy there or maybe that guy Garrett, but I don't really care at this point. All I'm saying is that whatever lives in this location here has a very close distance to its nearest neighbor. And we call that potentially informally a motif, a repeated kind of pattern. So the rest of the tutorial, I'll show typically the matrix profile in blue and regular normal time series in red. So the matrix profile by itself tells you simply how far things are to the nearest neighbors. It doesn't tell you where the nearest neighbor is. And so we're not actually remember that too. So we have another structure shown green called the matrix profile index. And it is also parallel to the time series and parallel to the matrix profile. And it simply has a bunch of integer pointers that say where that nearest neighbor is. So for example here, for my object here, its nearest neighbor turns out to be in location 1375, which is over here. So I now know two things. I know that for this subsequence here, its nearest neighbor's location is that location there. And its nearest neighbor's distance is that distance there. So of course, each one of these boxes has an arrow leaving it to find its nearest neighbor. But not every box has an arrow going to it. Not every object subsequence is the nearest neighbor to somebody else. And in general, these things are not necessarily symmetric, right? So A's nearest neighbor can be B, B's nearest neighbor can be C, C's nearest neighbor can be X. That's always a possibility. I guess one exception is 
the lowest value in the matrix profile has to have a mutually point instead of arrows. But apart from that, they're not necessarily symmetric. So briefly, why is it called a matrix profile? One way you could compute it, although it'd be very, very um, memory and time consuming, is as follows. You could take the long subsequence you have here, and you could actually slide the window across it, and you can measure the distance of every pair of subsequences to every, each other one. That actually would be just an upper matrix, or, or the upper diagonal, but actually I filled in symmetrically here for this picture. And so this matrix actually shows you the distance of every subsequence to every other subsequence. Of course, on the diagonal, that distance is always zero. Everything is zero distance to itself. So I'm going to exclude that. If I did compute this, then for any place like here, I can walk down here and look for the smallest value, not include the diagonal, the smallest value, and the smallest value I'm going to write down as the height here. And if I do that, I've not computed the matrix profile. So it's like a shadow, if some sense, a projection of a full matrix. But again, we never compute the full matrix. It would be completely infeasible. So how do you kind of read or interpret a matrix profile? And again, we're doing this as an academic exercise, and because it actually does offer some intuition, but the algorithms themselves don't even require you to do this. The algorithms actually simply call this as an internal routine, typically. If I look at this matrix profile, and I deliberately have not shown you the original time system in this case, by seeing this, you already know certain things. Whatever subsequence is here must be kind of unusual or unique or different to everything else. And that's why it has a high value, because its nearest neighbor is far away in Euclidean space. And when you see low values, it means that whatever's here must be repeated approximately at least once. Maybe actually twice in this case, because we have here, here, and here. But at least once this thing is repeated somewhere in the time series. And again, we don't know from this picture, but the matrix profile index would tell us that we would ask it that. So let's look at some synthetic examples to warm up a little bit here. Here's a bit of a fake time series, some sine waves with some noise, and I added an anomaly here deliberately. I put in the absolute value. And we can ask, what's the matrix profile look like for this? So almost everywhere, the values are very, very low because most of these subsequences here have a nearest neighbor that's almost identical here or here or here. But in this one location here, this subsequence here doesn't have a close match anywhere. It's unique. And because of that, its matrix profile index is maximally high. So one use of matrix profile is, in some sense, as an anomaly detector. Where you have high values, things are unique. So occasionally interested in those high values, occasionally interested in low values. So here, again, if you couldn't see the red time series, but look at the matrix profile, you can see there's low values here, and you know immediately that the subsequence correspond to this must have uh, a match, at least one, maybe more, somewhere in this time series. Okay, so we need to develop our intuition with the matrix profile, get some kind of uh, visual intuition as to how it looks and what it does. So let's actually spend maybe 10 minutes looking at various examples of it on some real data sets. And my point is simply here that although we typically just use this as an input to an algorithm, at this point we simply look at the matrix profile and get great intuitions right from the get go. So here's the data set. This is taxi demand in the fall in uh, New York, in uh, an industrial place, sorry, in downtown, I should say. And so, okay, there's some kind of obvious periodicity day by day, but what else can you say about this? Let's compute the matrix profile. Let's do it at a two-day uh, length and see what we see. And here's what we see. So most of the values are pretty low, which kind of makes sense. Most days are like most of the days, but there are actually some high values here. And what could they mean? So the first one actually is quite easy to understand. This one here corresponds exactly to Thanksgiving. And obviously Thanksgiving has a low down for taxis in downtown New York. That makes sense. So what I'm basically saying is, or what profile is saying is, this subsection here is high because this thing here is kind of unique. Now actually, it is unique within one year. I guess if you had multiple years, it wouldn't be unique. So it's a bit context dependent. So, um, the original authors of this paper who wrote this about this taxi stuff noticed this and they published this. But when we ran this, we found some other peaks that they hadn't noticed. So here's a secondary peak that's actually quite high. 
And I couldn't figure out what this actually corresponds to initially. It took me a few seconds, and then I got it. So this is actually daylight savings time, and that base wasn't adjusted. So one hour was actually spent into two hours, and they had the taxi demand for two hours compressed into one hour, if that makes sense. So the taxi demand that one hour is twice what it really is. And it's an obvious anomaly here. And then finally, it's another much more subtle, but nevertheless, some anomaly here. What could that possibly be? It actually corresponds to Columbus Day, which in most of America is inconsequential, but New York has lots of Italians. Columbus Day is a big deal uh, socially in New York. OK, so that's actually quite interesting. We're able to make this profile to find structure in this data set. And there's even some more structure here. So if you look at the smallest values, which actually happen to be here and here, we find actually they're exactly seven days apart. And so it's obvious that the daily periodicity here, the weekly periodicity is a little bit less obvious, but because these are seven days apart, it's suggestive of that. Now, of course, actually, you could do this almost by hand or by eye on this data set, but when you have bigger and bigger data sets, the tool becomes actually more and more useful. So here is a similar kind of data set. It's electrical demand for an Italian city, or I think three and a half years, and here it's hard to see what's happening. Right? You can see the yearly periodicity. This is August, August, August. Italians like to go to the beach. But otherwise, it's actually quite difficult to see what's actually happening here. But once again, the matrix profile, if you read it on this, gives you certain peaks here. And these are all corresponding to unusual holidays in Italy, uh, unusual sport events, and so forth. So all of these actually have a reasonable explanation. And they pop out easily in the matrix profile. Um, forgive me for just showing lots of examples. I think the examples are very helpful here. Here's uh, some heartbeats. And here's a matrix profile running those. And we can see actually there's a nice anomaly here, which is actually quite complicated and, and obvious. There's a more subtle anomaly here and so forth. And actually, if you have a doctor, which we had, zoom in on this, even these subtle anomalies here actually have a medical interpretation, which are very, very subtle. And what noticed by the original people who made this data set. As an aside, I did this on a batch data set, but actually you could do this with a matrix profile in real time on, an, on a smartphone or an Apple Watch. It's computationally quite undemanding to do. Well, we saw this example, let's see it again. This actually is a song of a zebra finch converted to MFCC. And we looked for motifs and patterns in this by using the matrix profile. And so the lowest values here and here are those subsequences, which correspond to one motif. And in gray, I show some more examples that are close to it uh, here. And we have motif two, motif three, and so forth. It's actually kind of fun to find because zebra finch is actually used to understand the nature versus nurture debate. So it actually turns out that the motifs you find in one bird will actually become somewhat passed on to its children. And you can ask, are the motifs passed on if the children can hear the father or not hear the father, and so forth. So once you find the motifs, you can actually do very interesting things in this space. So most of these times, they actually have a nice visual interpretation that you can look at by eye. But even at times it's actually very, very noisy, apparently, we actually can do this. So here's a seismology data set from a classic seismograph. And we run the matrix profile on this. And we find that it's mostly high everywhere. This is pure noise. But we actually have these severe dips here, these repeated patterns. And here they actually are zoomed in blue and gray. So what's happening here? In a sense, actually, it's actually the same earthquake, which is it happened in the exact same location. So earthquakes are waves. And like all waves, they get reflected and reflected as they go through different substrates. But if you have two earthquakes in the same location, they actually look the same in the waveform, even though it looks very noisy and complicated. We've actually done this with earthquakes that are separated by 20 years. And even 20 years apart, the conservation is perfect, basically. As it happens, it actually has a lot of implications for seismology in doing things like triangulation with, with only a single sensor as opposed to multiple sensors, and so on and so forth. I'll gloss over for now. But the point actually is we can do this at this kind of scale, which is very fast moving data and lots of it. Again, so I'd like to beat you over examples. I think the examples here are very helpful. This is actually DNA. Of course, DNA is discrete, but you can convert it to a time series in a lossless fashion. Actually, that's the full algorithm right there. And so here we took the DNA from the chimpanzee, which is red time series here. And we ran the, matri the, uh, sorry, the uh, matrix profile on this to find motifs. 
So here's the best motif here, and it corresponds to two time series shown here in green and red. And it's actually, it's repeated very beautifully over this very, very long period. As it happens, actually, it's a nice biological interpretation. Occasionally, pieces of DNA get snipped out and put back in twice, application. And it's actually useful to find these things. But you can actually do this with other techniques. My point actually here is the dimension of this is 60,000, which is inconceivable with almost any other algorithm you could actually do this. Because most algorithms I mentioned suffer highly from high dimensionality. Maybe one last example before I, I uh, walk away from this. If you run to make these profiles on music, you always find interesting things. So it happens that the highest value typically tends to be an instrumental bridge or a solo. It's a unique part of the song. But of course, you also have um, uh, low values here, motifs or repeated patterns. In this case, actually, it's a fade out or a chorus. Let it be, let it be, repeated multiple times. As it happens, actually, this has implications for music processing. We have a paper in uh, Izmir on this kind of stuff, but I'll gloss over that. If you actually want to read the slides online, you can play these, but I'll, I will um, spur you that for now. Let's actually summarize a little bit before we move on. What we've seen actually is quite surprising, I think. We've shown an algorithm that can find structure in taxi demand, electrical demand, DNA, zebra finches, heartbeats, all these different kind of data sets. But the algorithm doesn't know anything about the data. It's not tuned or tweaked for zebra finches versus humans. Right? It knows nothing. It simply gives you good, interesting answers on just any kind of data. So it's a very, very, very black box approach. And it's actually a great strength of this approach. Right? You can know nothing about your data set and get good results out of it in most cases. Lovely. So let's actually now look at some algorithms that actually operate in a matrix profile. I'll show some simple examples to gain your intuition. It is helpful for this actually to have to do a minor visual trick, which is this. Instead of looking at this space here, I can take this data, I can put this into a high dimensional space. So here I'm gonna take my subsequences of length 100. I'm gonna pull them out. I'm gonna put them into a hundred dimensional space. Obviously I'm gonna show you just two dimensions here for simplicity, but this is symbolically hundred dimensional space. And my point is that we can actually do motif discovery visually in this space more easily. So how would you actually find a set of motifs like a different zebra finches for the matrix profile? Well, I'm going to show you an algorithm that can do this. It's a simple, obvious algorithm, but there are other things you could do, potentially, that might be even better. Now, for this, we're going to need one parameter. The parameter is going to be some number, which is greater than one, and a small number. Let's say two is a reasonable number for now. OK? So here's my motif extraction algorithm that's going to find motifs in this red time series. I'm going to start by finding the closest pair, which in this space is that pair of objects here. And of course, that's simply just the smallest time values of the matrix profile. Now, here actually, I found two repeated patterns, but there might be more in my data set. So I need to actually get them onto a single group, a single cluster of motifs. And what I'm going to do this actually is by using this parameter OR here. I'm going to measure the distance between these two motifs, which I know from making this profile. I'm going to multiply it by the uh, OR value, which is two. And I'm going to draw two circles at a radius around each of those red points. And my claim is basically that anything that falls within the radius, this guy here, is really also part of that motif. It's another utterance of a bird song or, or another earthquake from the same family. And I'm going to call these three things here now motif one. It's as simple as that. Once I've done that, I can actually extract it from the data set and now do this recursively. Then I find the second best pair, the second closest pair, which I can do very quickly make this profile, which corresponds to those two pink objects here. I measure that distance, I multiply it by R, and I draw a circle of diameter around both of these in n-dimensional space. This time I find actually two things fit in here, this guy and this guy. And so these four things now are part of the secondary motif. And of course, I can simply do this until I'm exhausted. So in this case, actually, I probably would stop here. How you actually stop is an open problem. You can use things like MDL or various other things. But in many cases, actually, it just isn't that important. So here, actually, I ran this on some interesting data set from a, a penguin swimming underwater. And my first motif I found is right here. 
So I found two objects, as I promised, and those are shown here in um, cyan and green. And then I built my radius around that, and I found some other examples of this behavior, and it's my first motif. It's beautifully conserved, it must have some meaning, and actually corresponds to a special dive maneuver this bird makes. And then again, I did this again for the second motif here, with this guy here, and it's not as well conserved, but it still is actually pretty well conserved. It's my number two motif. And when I ran it again, the third one actually is kind of borderline random and probably actually isn't significant, and I simply just push that aside. So here are the claims by I. I have two motifs here, but you can do this more formally with various different criteria. So it's actually as easy as that to find motifs in your data set. This tool, by the way, actually is online for free. You can grab this, you can toss your data into it, and a few seconds later we'll discover what your heart, your bird, your data set is doing. Now here's a very cool generalization of this. Here's a data set which is similar, but a little bit different. Look at these blue points here. They're kind of a motif, but a motif really is basically an idealized point in space with some observed values that are kind of randomly around it, like this thing here. But these actually seem to form a kind of a trail or a chain through space. It's easy to see if I give you the arrival times. Here are the arrival times. This came, let's say, in January, then February, then March, and so forth. So what I actually suggest actually is that we have some kind of um, a pattern that repeats, but changes in a systematic way. This is actually kind of cool because it's actionable. So what I tell you, an 11 point arrives tomorrow. Where's the 11 point going to arrive if you had to guess? My guess is 11 points are going to arrive somewhere here. So I can weakly predict the future if I can understand this. So given that, we call these things time series chains. This is unpublished work, but I think very interesting and cool. I guess there are two questions which are, do these things actually exist in the real world or the synthetic theoretical construct? And the second question is, can you find them? Let me answer the second question first because the answer is yes. The matrix profile that you find these things very trivially. So the second part actually is easily solved. The first part actually is, do they exist in the real world? And the cool thing actually is, once you understand this, you find these things everywhere. Let's see some examples. Here we have a gentleman on a tilt table. He's resting until this time here. And then we begin to induce a tilt and move him down a little bit. Let's run chain discovery on this. And it's like you zoom into the section here. And what we see actually at that point, time point here we begin to tilt is that we actually do get a, a chain which we discover in our data set automatically. And the chain actually corresponds to the fact that this dichotic notch here is getting weaker and weaker and weaker as we tilt the sky. And there are good medical reasons for this which I'll gloss over here. Once again, it's actually is fruitful because I can actually now predict if you have to guess what the next beat's gonna be like over here, you can guess it's gonna keep on getting weaker and weaker and weaker. I've taken these chains we discovered, and I brushed the links onto the actual time series, and you see actually we're, we're missing a few points. So my student Yan designed this algorithm, and it's very nice because it's very robust. So it'd be easy to find chains in a kind of a perfect data set, but if you have that that's very noisy and corrupt, missing elements and so forth, you want the algorithm to still be robust to this. So the algorithm actually is quite robust, even to noisy and strange data, and it can still find chains in the, in the data set. Here's another thing that's actually quite interesting. This is the web demand for the word Coles, an American department store, in 10 years of data. And of course, you obviously did the overall growing trend of internet traffic, which will not surprise you. But there's actually a chain in this data set, which has a nice intuition. Let's actually look at this. So a long time ago, 2004, people had the internet, and they used it to find Coles, basically to find out where the nearest one is, where the park, where the hours are, and they would drive there and shop. So there's a busy section here between Thanksgiving and Christmas for the holiday period. But over time, look what happens. The demand at Thanksgiving relative to Christmas grows and grows and grows and grows, and now Thanksgiving becomes more important than Christmas. And those of you who've been alive the last decade will know what this is. This is Black Friday, so Christmas shopping typically now starts on the Friday after Thanksgiving, and people actually don't drive to Coles, they shop online for Coles. 
And once again, this is actually actionable because this is 2014. If you had to guess what 2015 looks like, you can simply just interpolate from this and actually you would be right. And again, beyond being actionable, a nice puppet this actually is, it's very robust. So this data set is actually undersampled and noisy and there are other events, stock markets and things that happen here that means that there aren't every single link in the chain, but the overall chain is robust at that and we still find this nice evolution over time. And my last example, uh, which actually I really love, uh, but uh, I will try to spare you, but I'm going to give you one minute summary of this. We have a data set from Magellan Penguin as it um, goes with daily business. And these guys find most of their food quite deep underwater, tens of meters below. This is a tiny subset of the data to show how complicated it is. It's a very nasty data set. And this is actually a zoom in of the zoom in here. And in this data set, we find the chain. I've shown you some links here that evolve. And you actually can see the beginning of the chain and the end of the chain here. So what's happening here? It took us a while to figure it out, but here's what's actually happening. This guy wants to spend time underwater chasing its uh, food, which means he has to take a deep breath to stay under the water. But if you take a deep breath, you become very buoyant, and it's hard to actually swim underwater to get down low, and you have equalization of pressure. So basically, this guy has to take a deep breath and swim really, really hard to get down to his cruising speed where he's neutrally buoyant. Okay, so you might think you would do that by actually flapping his wings faster at the beginning and then slower as it gets down deeper, but this bird actually can't for its logical reasons. But what he can do is change the angle of attack of his wings. So basically what you see with these chains here actually is the evolution of the wing angle as he goes deeper and deeper underwater. So you may not be interested in birds, maybe interested in shopping customers or uh, electrical power demand that might be, but the basic idea actually is true, which is you can take data sets which are very, very complicated and have no obvious patterns by eye. You can run chain discovery, which is basically matrix profile with some lines of code, and you can find these very cool patterns which actually make sense, and in some cases actually are actionable. In some cases actually you can change the world based upon these chains to sell more Pepsi or to prevent blackouts or whatever it might be. So from chains, let's look briefly at anomaly detection. Anomaly detection, of course, is a very interesting problem to solve in all kinds of domains because anomalies typically cost lives, cost problems, or these opportunities to save some money. Now, there are literally hundreds of papers on anomaly detection, dozens of conference alone. But one of the best ideas, empirically, is something called time series discords. Don't thank my word for it, uh, but Pin Kumar, who's a keynote speaker at this conference, actually did a kind of cook-off with his students with many data sets, many algorithms, and basically said the best algorithm overall is time series discords. This is good news for us because time series discords are simply the highest value of nothing else. So we have them for free. There's nothing to do other than find the maximum value, and we're done. So why are discords so effective? And here's my opinion about this. They make no assumptions about the data, and with no assumptions, you have no wrong assumptions, by definition. And secondly, they don't have many parameters. So many anomaly detectors people have published have, including myself, I should say, have three or four or five parameters you have to tune. And you tune them, they works well on last week's data, but next week's data has changed slightly and no longer works. So with no parameters to tune, you can't overfit. So there's almost nothing to say. I can actually walk away from this now because we already have this, times that this course are free, it's the maximum value matrix profile. But I will show you for fun one pathological but fixable case. So going back to this world here, here's our data set in high dimensional space. And here is one subsequence that's actually far from everything else. This is the highest location of matrix profile. This is an anomaly. Maybe the valve in the machine was stuck one day. We got a strange time series. That's what it would be. So actually, if this is true, we're done. We find this and we're uh, done with this. However, suppose the anomaly happens twice. The machine gets stuck two different days. Then actually there's two of these, and this actually is no longer an anomaly because it's similar to this and that's similar to that, and that anomaly is something very trivial over here. So the definition actually can be a little bit brittle to a pathological case, but you can easily fix that by saying that the discord is the distance, not to the nearest neighbor, but to the second nearest neighbor or the kth nearest neighbor. 
and we can support that matrix profile very trivially, and we again have a robust anomaly detector. So the new definition, we're back to find this, the anomaly. I'm not going to show you many examples of this because you've already seen examples earlier on, just kind of implicitly, not explicitly. So when I showed you this time series here and this matrix profile, the highest value is exactly the definition of the time series discord. And the second highest non-trivial value is the second highest uh, discord in the data set. So discords are very strong anomaly detectors, and you have them for free matrix profile. None you have to do. Lovely. Let's generalize a little bit. So you can see that the matrix profile has been like a self-join. You're taking all subsequences in a time series and compare them to all other ones, and you're joining them to itself. But instead, actually, you have two different time series, maybe last year and this year, or a male and a female, whatever it might be, and you can join those two separate data sets and make a matrix profile too. So that actually is asymmetric. You can join A to B, or you can join B to A. Those are asymmetric things. But once you do this, it's basically the same thing. It's a matrix profile, and all our algorithms are still defined. Chain discovery, motif discovery, discord discovery, and so on and so forth. So two cases of interest here, which are exactly the opposite, and they are the analogs of discords and motifs. The first one I call the golden batch. So here we have two times that we think should be the same, and are they the same is the question. Let me give an example. In industry, people often want to build something, a wafer or some chemical, and so they have a perfect golden batch. Everything is clean, everything is tuned up, the best engineer runs the recipe, and he makes the food or the chemical or the wafer. That's the prototypical golden batch. We try to be close to that next week on the next cycle. If next week or next cycle we run this and we join these two things together, we can look at the join, again, not in this space, typically in the profile space, and see if it's actually true. So for the most part, Last week and this week were almost identical, looks good. But there's one thing here that happened in A but not in B. And we can ask why that is the case, because maybe that was a, a, a mistake, a, a change that wasn't expected, and we can go fix that. I'll show you an example of this in a moment, it's more intuitive. So again, here the idea is two things should be the same, and where the difference was interesting. But the opposite is also possibly true. Two things should be different, and they actually are the same occasionally, and why is that? I call that the suspicious similarity. So if we have two different data sets, completely different, and we run a join, and of course they are different, so mostly you have stuff over here, which you have stuff over here, but there's one section here that actually looks like, uh, the, the greens look like the blues, and you don't know why. And again, I'm just some examples here in a moment of this. Uh, before I get there, Here's the basic intuition, but actually I can kind of gloss over this. It's almost identical to the simple case we've already seen before. Instead of having one time series now, we have two. We have A and B, and we can join the subsequences of A, the subsequences of B. <coughs> and we're going to make this profile for whichever time series is the target. And as before, we actually have an index here, and the index, of course, now actually goes from this time series to that time series. And we can rest direction. Okay, so let me gloss over all that. Okay, so here's actually two examples of a join. So here are two time series, and the question is, if I join them, is there any similarity between them? In this case, actually, there are two very different objects. There should be no similarity between them, as we'll see. And when I join them, actually, I find there is similarity. So actually, the best join subsequence is this thing here, which is clearly very, very similar. And you can ask what that actually is. And many of you will know what this is already. So the first one actually is a song converted to MFEC. It's uh, Under Pressure by Queen Bowie, two of the greatest artists ever lived. A great song. The second one actually is by an artist called uh, Vanilla Ice, who basically stole or sampled some notes from this song. And so when you join these two things, you actually find that this actually is the conserved baseline between them. Now, this actually is a very fun, trivial example from, in culture. But you can do this in other domains which are very, very interesting. So suppose you actually have two patients who have some kind of disease, and you think, is there any similarity between them? Maybe they both have blue eyes, maybe they're both obese, these are trivial things. But you actually ask, maybe are their heartbeats or their brainwaves similar sometimes? 
So you can measure the physiological signals as time series. You can join them and say, yes, these guys are both sick and they both share this kind of heartbeat or they both share this kind of a brain wave. So this might be a clue into this disease, right? Likewise, we've done this in an industrial sentence where we actually have people make these um, chemicals and occasionally get a bad batch. The chemical is bad. And so you can join these two traces. You can say, yes, when you make a bad batch, there's a tiny subset here which actually is the same each time. And it's because we're actually cooling the system too fast. And then we can go and fix that. So the ability to make these joins actually is very, very exciting in industrial and medical situations. Let's actually look at the opposite case. Here we have two other time series, a small snippet or subset of this. And now I actually want to find, is there anything that's in A that's not in B? So actually here I believe that these two time series should be basically the same overall. I'm looking for differences this time. Let me show you what is not the answer. So this is not the answer here because this actually kind of happens here, right? And this is not the answer either because this actually happens here. So the location makes a difference, but do these patterns here happen here? So I want to find a pattern that happens in one, doesn't happen in the other. And in this case, the answer actually is, these are the spoken word versions of Harry Potter. And Harry Potter, for some reason, in England is spoken by one actor, Stephen Fry, and in America, a different English actor, also uh, Jim Dale. And mostly, as you can see here, they're word for word perfect. It's the same books, but occasionally, an actor makes a mistake and isn't caught by the editor. And we can actually find those very nicely with this algorithm. Because we simply ask, what's in A that's not in B? And we actually find some sentences which are actually put in incorrectly, misspoken. And again, doing this by hand or by eye would be very, very, very difficult. The algorithm simply just pops these things out and you can find them very trivially. Once again, it's actually kind of trivial. I don't care about Harry Potter, maybe you don't either. But once again, actually, these actually could be very interesting data sets. It could be medical or industrial or customers, and no much different could be the key insight that will make you money or save lives. Let's look at some more examples of joins for fun. Developing intuitions. Here are two pieces of DNA, and they're um, of length about three and a half million each. And I want to join these. But for fun, actually, with some intuition, before I joined them, I took one of them and flipped it backwards. And after I flipped it backwards and joined them, I found this beautiful join here. So here it is in the green and red. And the gray is something some context on either side of it. And you can see actually, this is actually conserved beautifully, but only if you flip it backwards. So once again, you can kind of guess what happened here. Some in the past, in evolution, that was pulled out, put back in, backwards at uh, this location right here. And once again, it's kind of trivial to do this. You can do this other ways. But once again, it's just you can do this at this kind of a scale. Because it's actually 3 million by 3 million. So the sequence length is 100,000. This would be inconceivable of any other technique in the joint space to do this, with all trees or anything like that. OK, let's actually shift topics a moment. And let's just look at another algorithm we can do with the matrix profile. This problem is called segmentation, and here's the basic idea. Here we have multiple time series. We look at each independently, by the way. And at the time where the color changes, the world's also changing. So for this poor pig here, unfortunately, he's uh, sedated. At this point here, they actually begin to open up his uh, skin for medical research. And this individual here is a bit unhealthy. At that point here, he has what's called pulse paradoxes. It's a medical problem I'll gloss over and so on and so forth. Here actually we have a robot dog with some accelerometers in it, and he's walking. At that point, he stops walking and begins to actually play soccer instead. And so the question is, can you detect when the world has changed? This actually is hard for some reasons. One reason is because that actually occasional change can be very subtle. The change here is quite subtle. The change here is quite subtle. Occasionally, that actually is very, very noisy and complex. So although actually it's pretty obvious there's a change here, you might have guessed there's a change here, which there isn't, or there's a change here, which there isn't. This is the only case that has to change. So there's a lot of algorithms that work on this kind of problem, and most of them actually are very particular algorithms. There's algorithms for human motion. There's algorithms for human motion only the legs, algorithms for human motion only the hands, and so forth. 
My claim actually is, to make this profile, we can have one algorithm that does all of those things, does it better than all the other algorithms, and is very cheap and easy and lightweight. Let's see it. So we want an algorithm to have various properties. We want it to handle either huge batch data from last year on a hard drive, or do data in real time on an iPhone. It has to be fast. And we want to be domain agnostic. Having a new algorithm for every kind of pig or human or whatever it might be is simply untenable. Let's have one size fits all if we can. As always, every parameter light will be very accurate. We want to be able to support the degree of segmentation or confidence, say how sure we are the world has changed. And I can actually is we can do all of this almost for free. Here's how. So here we have a time series, and Instead of looking to make this profile, let's look at the make this profile index only this time. And we call it make this profile index, it's simply a bunch of arrows that say where everything's nearest neighbor is. So for example, this guy here has a nearest neighbor here, that guy there has a nearest neighbor here, and so forth. So here's the following intuition, which is that you would expect that most of these arrows will point internally contiguous regions. So few arrows should cross where the behavior has actually changed. Now you think of this actually for running and walking. If I have a section of running, then walking, most runs point to other runs, most walks point to other walks, it's very rare a run will point to a walk or vice versa. So if I simply was to walk across this time series and count how many arrows cross my head, that'd be a good clue as has the world changed. If many arrows cross my head, it means I'm in a homogeneous region. When I get to the change point, no arrows cross my head, and that means the world might have changed at that point. With that one simple clue, we can do very, very well. Let's see this. So this is actually is exactly this. This red time series here actually is the arc count. And so when I'm here, many arcs cross off my head. I have a high count. But when I get to here where the world has changed, very, very few, almost zero arrows cross over my head. And so I'm going to guess here the world has changed. So I've actually successfully segmented my data with that one simple clue. OK, a few minor tweaks here. Obviously, the number of arrows across over my head at the very beginning and the very end are zero or low. <coughs> so I should compensate for that. I did it quite easily. The number of arrows across over my head, if there's no structure, is actually this shape here. It's a parabola with ha its height half the width. So this is my null case. I can subtract this from this to correct it and get this. And this is even better. So now I have no end effect um, problems, and I have the minimization in the right location. OK. This data set actually is nice and clean and beautiful. Suppose it's actually it's a more complicated data set. Let's actually try this by adding some noise. Let's actually take this data set and corrupt it and see if it still works. So we can corrupt this in many ways. We can downsample the data. We can change the cardinality of the bits to only 8-bit. We can add linear trend. We can add white noise. We can smooth it. We can delete some of the data randomly. You can do all these attacks here. And for all these attacks, we have the same minimum in the right location. The only attack that really changes, actually, is Add noise. But even then, add noise, it shifts the curve up a little bit, but the minimum is actually in the right location. It still segments at the right place. And the noise we added actually is very, very significant. So it's robust to all kinds of attacks because it isn't really looking at global structure, it's looking at lots of local structure instead. So, how well does this actually work? We've actually tested this on the largest collection of data sets and it's ever attempted, and it works very, 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 very well. There's exactly one parameter for this. The parameter is how long should m be? How long should a subsequence be? But for that one parameter, you can change it by an order of magnitude and get the right result each time. So it's incredibly robust at a single parameter. So I'll gloss over all the examples of this, but I'll show you, well, I'll show you a few. Um, but it works beautifully in all kinds of data sets, and it's completely domain agnostic. It doesn't care what the data actually is. It doesn't know. So here actually is a nasty data set. We have one bird singing. And then a, a guy takes over, and another guy takes over instead. We run this, and it minimizes correctly at the two changeover points. This is a very cool data set. This is actually a leaf hopper. 
we wire it up to some golden wires. We measure its voltage to the plant, and we can actually change, look at its behavior in that case. We have experts actually look at the behavior and tell us what kind of feed it's doing, and it changes behavior at exactly that location here. And it's a noisy, complicated data set, but once again, we minimize basically in the right place. There's actually a very surprising data set. There's a disease called Pulsus paradoxus, and you can get it quite successfully from PPG, from a, like a person's finger. But it's not supposed to show up in heartbeats directly. It's too subtle to see. Nevertheless, it does show up in heartbeats, and I don't actually can find it. So actually here, the doctor who's in the room with the patient at the time has annotated that the world has changed at this point for this poor patient. And our algorithm robustly finds this, even though in principle it should not be possible to see this in the signal. <coughs> so let me just quickly summarize this part of this talk. The Betty's profile allows simple algorithm to segmentation. And my claim is it is the best segmentation algorithm in the world, hands down. It's incrementally computable, so it's faster than real time. You can run it on a smartwatch or smartphone. It's domain agnostic. You can do it in any kind of data set without actually having to tune or tweak it for every case. And it's very parameter light and parameter free. Lovely. So thus far, I've shown you these algorithms, which are completely parameter free. I don't know what the data is, I don't care what the data is, I run it, and I find motifs or change or segments, and I walk away and I'm done. However, you're sitting there thinking, yes, but my data is special, or my needs are special, this won't work for me. And that might be true, but here's the good news. There's a simple trick you can do called the annotation vector, which lets you take your domain knowledge and expertise and push it into everything we've done here today with three or four lines of code. And now all these algorithms will adapt to your particular needs. It's a very exciting idea, and we'll debut it in this conference with my student, Anne. Let me give you a preview here today. So again, the intuition is that the Betty's profile is a wonderful thing. Hopefully you agree. It's very cool and very useful. But we can now take your particular needs or constraints and brush them onto this stuff to get um, tailored um, data sets, sorry, tailored answers for you. Let's just more of an example to get uh, understand working here. Uh, here we actually have a data set, and I ran motif discovery in this, and I found motifs here and here, and here they are. This actually is disappointing to me because this is not real medical data. That's real medical data here. This actually is what happens when the sensor becomes loose on the chest. The system actually sends out a calibration signal with some noise to say you're not actually uh, getting medical data at this point. And the problem actually is that because these things are so frequent, and many data sets actually that most of the data is like this, the algorithm actually will tend to find these as motifs and not these for medically significant. So when I run this on these norm, enormous batches of data, I find lots of these square motifs which I don't care about, I won't find the real medical motifs. So the question is, how could I actually solve this? And as we'll see in a moment, we can solve it in a very trivial way that's very generic for all kinds of data sets. This is our first problem, which is stop word bias. Another problem you might have in your domain is specificity bias. So here we actually have a data set, and if I ask you what the motifs are here, your eye would say, oh, that guy here is repeated almost exactly twice. That's interesting to me. But amazingly, motif discovery will not find these. It'll actually find the motif actually has been this simple thing here instead. The reason why it actually is understood it isn't the problem with the motif discovery algorithm per se, it's a problem with Euclidean distance. Euclidean distance is kind of biased towards finding simple patterns sim uh, similar more than complicated patterns. And I want to actually kind of get past that bias and say, I don't really care about the simple stuff, show me the complicated stuff that's actually similar. Once again, how can we do this? And once again, we'll see in a moment, it's actually going to be very, very easy with the addition vector. <coughs> Here's a more generic example. You might actually have some need you want, which is hard to specify for external reasons. You might, for example, say, this is good, I like motifs, but I want motifs to happen near the weekend. So I can sell shoes, I can do whatever it might be. So I find my motifs, but I want to be kind of close to the weekend. Or you might say in the oil and gas space, these motifs are good, but for me to make actually money on this, I need to find motifs that actually end with a rise in trend, not a fall in trend, anything else. Find motifs that end with a rise in trend. So of course, I can actually have arbitrary 
questions here I want to find. And my claim actually is now we're going to be able to find all of these things in a very simple way. <coughs> so we could actually try to have different algorithms to support these things, but it happens that we be very complicated and nasty and slow, and there's no need. We can still use a one size fits all matrix profile plus three or four lines of code and take any arbitrary need you have and brush it onto our algorithms. The idea actually is I'm going to make an addition vector, which is the main dependent, and it's going to change slightly the solution matrix profile to be more tailored towards what you want. Let's make this clear now with the example we've already seen, which is the weekend preference. This is a real data set of some um, Dodger Stadium, and some traffic control person wants to find motifs in this, but as it happens for their particular need, they want to find motifs that happen on and near the weekend. So with this person and four lines of Excel, we can write the following addition vector. This vector says, okay, if it's a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, my preference for motifs in the space is zero. I don't want them. If it's a Saturday or Sunday, my preference actually is strong. It's as strong as it can be. It's a one. And my preference rises beginning on Friday, gets higher, and then on Sunday night, it goes down over Monday. So this actually encodes my preference for finding motifs in this domain. And when I specify this, again, with one line of MATLAB or three lines of Excel, I can now use this to actually adjust the matrix profile for motifs, for chains, for segmentation, and so forth, to find an answer suitable with this particular preference. So how do I actually take this attention vector and combine the matrix profile? This simple equation will do it. This is called the correct matrix profile. It's a matrix profile with a slight nudge. So I simply use the original matrix profile, I mentioned vector, I kind of normalize it, and I'm going to make a subtle change that's going to actually give me motifs tailored for my particular need. And the need here, annotation vector, can be arbitrary. It can be for your domain. <coughs> so my key claim here actually is that for most problems, whether an entomologist or a nematologist or archaeologist, whatever it might be, you can sit down, you can think about what you want, you can write it down in three lines in MATLAB, and now all my algorithms will work for you beautifully, but for your particular domain. Let's see our examples here. We saw this example earlier on, which is we have this stop word bias. That these square waves are very boring, and they keep showing up. I want to suppress them. All I have to do is take one of these square waves and use it to actually find nearest neighbors, and use nearest neighbor profile here to suppress those particular shapes. So I've done this actually in linear time, and I have this annotation vector here. Where it's zero, it says, don't find motifs that look like that thing there, but everywhere else is reasonable. With that linear time step, I have an addition vector. I can combine it with the original matrix profile now to get the right answer. So here's the original matrix profile, and here's the corrected version. It looks almost the same, but I've subtly nudged up these trivial shapes that I want, and now I find the lowest values here and here, I find the actual motifs I was expected to find. So with a few lines of MATLAB code, I could actually simply stop finding these trivial patterns in my domain. And of course, you may have different trivial patterns in your domain, you do the exact same thing. Here's another example. We have this lovely data set, and there are medical motifs in this space here, which are very interesting I want to find, but I can't find them. And the reason is because we have these motion artifacts. The patient was uh, flopping around in the bed, causes these huge waves, which as it happens, tend to produce motifs. So what I want to say actually is, find motifs in this space, but not in that space here. And of course, if I have 24 hours of this, or years of this, I can't go in by hand and say, not here, not here, not here. I have to find an algorithm. And the algorithm actually is simply the addition vector tuned to say, suppress these things here. So how am I going to do that? As it happens, i got a nice uh, little trick I can do here, which is these sensors actually have, in addition to the medical sensor, an accelerometer on them. And the accelerometer knows if you're shaking in your bed. So we simply use high acceleration to depress the annotation vector, like so. So at this point here, we have no preference of finding motifs because we have high acceleration. Here we have reasonable low acceleration. We have normal um, preference for motifs. In this case, actually, two lines of MATLAB. I can suppress the bad motifs, and I can find only the good motifs. So uh, here's a zoom in of that. 
once I've done this, I now find these beautiful medical motifs which are actually significant. I've suppressed the trivial examples. Maybe one more example that's kind of fun to see. This is a data set of eye movement, people who sleep. We have you know, many years of this data set uh, in different sleep studies. And unfortunately, actually, we find these motifs constantly like so. And so why we find these motifs? As it happens, this system is actually under um, power, basically, and it's, it's bit limited. So actually, here is the maximum number of, of uh, values we can have. So the time stress actually does something above this we cannot see. And because we have these flat regions in common, they're very, very similar, and so we actually have this motif, which may be a real motif, or maybe isn't. I can't tell because I'm missing this. Now, I don't want to say, don't give me this, because it is reasonably similar. But I want to say, actually, I prefer not to find motifs that have too much of this. So it's very easy to actually specify this. We can simply say, let's count how many regions we have which are constant, and use that to actually suppress the motif discovery algorithm appropriately. And when we do this, we go from finding these motifs here, which are probably trivial, to finding these two here, which actually are real medical motifs, which suggest REM sleep. So all these examples show, you can sit down with your expert, your doctor, your industrial guy, ask him to say, tell me about your machine, tell me about your preference, tell me about what it is you want to find. You can code up in three lines of code, and now all my algorithms are available to you to actually run. One last example, simplicity bias. On this trivial data set here, if I actually define motifs, you probably would say, oh, here's the motif here in red. It's you know, that guy or that guy or that guy repeated. But as it happens, the real algorithm will actually find for you this kind of trivial L shape. And the reason is because Euclidean distance, as I mentioned, prefers to find simple shapes. I will find the simple shape, not this more complicated shape, which is a bit further than Euclidean space, but it's still much more interesting. And once again, we can fix this in a few milliseconds, right? It's so simple. So we make an annotation vector in three lines of MATLAB that says penalize for very simple patterns and reward for more complicated patterns. And we can do this reward in multiple ways. We could use, for example, the number of zero crossings, which here is quite large, or we could use standard deviation, or we could use other things. As it happens here, we use one thing called complexity. It almost makes no difference. The point is, when we change the annotation vector, we can actually find these things here very, very quickly. So let me summarize this because it's the most complicated part of the tutorial. My claim is actually we have this generic algorithm, make this profile, which can do almost everything you want to do. Classification, cluster, motif discovery, anomaly detection, segmentation, and so forth. And in almost every case, it's good enough out of the box. It's domain independent. It doesn't care. But if you do have a special need because of your machine, because of your doctor, because of your um, problem, because of your legal uh, implications, you can actually just take two lines of code, three lines of code, to write an addition vector to adjust the solution to suit what you want instead. And actually, once you invent an addition vector, you can actually reuse it on new data sets in the same domain. You can publish it. You can actually patent it. You can actually put it out there that's your intellectual property. You can reuse it, basically. Lovely. OK, we're getting close to the um, break point. You'd be glad to know. Before we finish, let's actually look at one more idea. <coughs> I want to make what's actually probably a quite dramatic claim, which is to make this profile actually which you think of has been coming for free. We'll explain in the, in the later half of the afternoon, but basically it's a black box, it's actually for free. And my claim actually is that using this make this profile for free, plus 10 lines of code, you can duplicate the results of hundreds of papers that have been published in the last few years in this conference. Think about it, if that's true, that's quite exciting because if one trivial primitive plus of code can duplicate hundreds of papers in the past, that suggests that maybe going forward, the basis profile plus 10 lines of code that you write will give you a new paper or help you solve a new problem. Things that I haven't thought of, you'll be able to do with the basis profile and the 10 lines of code. So I'm actually writing a paper on this right now, and we have actually dozens of examples that people actually have done this uh, by volunteer. We've kind of crowdsourcing this. Let me show you one concrete example to make this actually clear. And again, it's a, a very strong dramatic claim, but actually is true. So here's my example here. Here we have a time series, and I deliberately embedded some motifs in. I took some patterns from this data set, and I put in two examples of them. So obviously, trivially here, I have a motif. 
when I want to rent its profile on this, and I ask it the best pair of motifs, it finds those two guys that are very similar. Life is good. I can actually go kind of hurt the data set a little bit here, hurt the algorithm, in the following way. I'm going to take the second half of this data set, I'm going to stretch it by 5%. This happens in the real world. People actually walk faster, walk slower, or music speeds up, music slows down. What's actually very surprising is, if I change the length of the second half by 5%, I no longer find this to be the best motif. Why is that? Well, Euclidean distance summarizes the distances you know, point by point. And at the beginning, they look quite similar. But over that time, the 5% begins to accumulate and add up. And the distance here becomes larger and larger and larger and larger and larger and larger. And eventually, the distance between these two things becomes greater than two random objects. And I find these two random objects to be the best motif which is clearly not what I wanted or expected. So here in this case, that 5%, you can see difference right here, is enough to kind of cripple my algorithm and find various results. People have done this before, and they actually have special algorithms to find motifs on their uniform scaling. And those algorithms are approximate, complicated, clumsy, slow parameter laden. My claim is, once again, I can actually solve this problem with the matrix profile plus 10 lines of code or less, actually. And so here is two lines of code. Let's actually, I noticed actually it's happening in my data set, and I think actually that the change in ratio is 164% for some reason. I can solve this now with two lines of code. All I had to do is, my first line of code, is take the time series and make a copy of it, make the copy a little bit longer. In MATLAB, I could do it this way here, basically. So in one line of code, I've taken my time series, made a copy of it, that's stretched by 164%. And now I'm gonna actually, this is actually real code, by the way, and I simply just run my matrix profile join from T, the short version, to T2, the longer version, and the result of matrix profile will minimize at the joint location of the two different lengths. Here's an example of this. This is actually real data from a uh, power demand. This is a dishwasher. And for some reason, January 14, we see this. But generally, 18, it's much more compressed. Probably the water's preheated for some reason, what it might be. OK, so in two lines of code, I could actually join these two things beautifully, even on a different lens. Now, of course, actually, I cheated here because I knew the difference was 164%. If I don't know the difference, I have to test all differences. That's actually very trivial. I have a small for loop. I test all different scaling factors from 100, 101, 102, 103, up to whatever value I want, and return the best value there. So it's, it's kind of a small but dramatic claim. My claim actually is I can reproduce many papers, including a few in this conference, with a matrix profile, which I get for free, plus a few lines of code, and I'm done. And once again, my hope my claim actually is that you'll do great things with this too. You'll take the matrix profile, you'll add your five or six or 10 lines of code, and you'll solve problems that never occurred to me to actually try and solve. Lovely. We're about ready for the uh, lunch break or coffee break. Let me just summarize here. We've actually seen today, so far, many cool things you do to make the profile, but we haven't seen how to compute it. We simply assume it's given to us for free, and then we do wonderful things, motif discovery, anomaly detection, chain discovery, segmentation, and so forth. And so this divorce actually is delivered for two reasons. One of which actually is it helps to actually do the um, tutorial, but it's actually a philosophical idea. And the reason is because in your company, you can actually separate these two things completely. The guys who compute the matrix profile is one team, and the guy who uses it is a completely different team. And they almost don't have to talk to each other. Right? It's actually a very, very useful ab abstraction. As it happens, for most people, say 90%, you have nothing to do. The matrix profile is already fast enough for the average person, and the average use, the average doctor. It's only for really people who need to do very large data sets. You actually have to really think about this more carefully and get the matrix profile more efficiently. And my colleague, in the second half of the talk, will actually explain how to do this using various tricks like GPUs and the cloud and so on and so forth. OK, at this point, I'm going to break for coffee. Hope we'll see you all about 15 minutes or so. Um, you're up to go now. If you have any questions, I'll actually entertain them now or at the end of the tutorial. Um, thank you for your attention. <laughs>